Hi everyone, we are back with week five and this week we're talking about analyzing data from the Stroop experiment that we programmed last week in JS Psych. And we're gonna do this in R. This is not a, a big in-depth tutorial on using R. The focus of this course is to be using JavaScript to make JS Psych experiments. Um, but you know we wanna be able to analyze the data after we're, after we're done running the experiment. And it's really important to look at how you would do that as a part of thinking about how you would build the experiment. So let's uh, talk about what we're gonna go over. Um, the concept of pilot piloting an experiment where you, uh, you know, run yourself as a participant several times to get the kinks out of your design. We talk about saving data from a JS Psych experiment. And uh, just a couple simple ways to do that. This time we can get more complicated later on when we uh, discuss using a server or other things like data pipe. We'll do a really quick R review. And then I'll show you some examples of some R scripts that we could use to uh, analyze our Stroop data in R. And so the assignment for this week is three things. First of all, you're gonna obtain the sample data from this tutorial and show that you can conduct the analysis that we go through here in your blog post. And this should be as simple as getting the files, copying the code and making sure you can run it. You'll have to install a couple R libraries. Then um, you should have programmed a Stroop experiment last week and I'll have you pilot that. And that means run through it a couple times to generate your own uh, data files, as if say three or four participants had run through the experiment. Finally, see if you can analyze that data in R by modifying the example scripts as necessary. Uh, one of the things from last week was uh, you, you had to think of a manipulation that might change the size of the Stroop effect. And so by running through this exercise, you should be able to analyze your own data to see if that actually happened for your data. We're going to jump over to our studio, where we'll be spending most of our time this week. Okay, as you could see, I made a fifth blog post here. And I'm working on it just like this. So this could be like your blog post. We just went over these concepts that I'm going to cover. And uh, OK, so let's work through it. I'm not going to talk too much about piloting an experiment, I guess, other, other than it's a super important thing to do. And uh, what that really means is just running yourself in your own experiment multiple times to generate data. And uh, this will help you understand whether this experiment makes sense for other people to try. And even if everything about the experiment is perfect in terms of what you want to happen, uh, you really want to make sure that the data file that is produced by this thing can be analyzed. And uh, so it's important to generate at least several example data files and uh, then put it into your analysis workflow to, to see you know, if, it, if it can be analyzed. So I went ahead and did that. I took the Stroop 2 experiment from last week and I ran myself in it three times and I generated three CSV files. Now I want to show you one modification I made to the Stroop data or to the Stroop JS Psych file. If you go all the way down to, oh, I guess it's not the bottom. It's the part where we save the data. And that is actually right here, line 24, where we initialize JS Psych, there's a on finish function. Now this occurs at the end of the experiment and it triggers the JS Psych display data function. So previously, this was just empty like that. And at the end of the experiment, we would see a bunch of data be displayed in the web browser. And that, that data format was called JSON for JavaScript object notation. 
we can change the format and JSON works too, but for this example, uh, I changed the format to CSV, which stands for comma separated value. And I can show you quickly what it looked like in the web browser after the end of an experiment. So this would be what it looked like. And this is uh, just a plain text file that's being shown in the browser. What I did was try to select everything and I wanted to make sure I got everything. So I did command A to get the whole thing from the beginning to end. And then I went over to R here and uh, simply started making new files. So for example, I click this button, choose text file, and I made a CSV file here. I called it S1 for the first uh, subject. And I pasted in, whoops, got to copy that and paste it in and save. And so now we have a CSV file. All right, I'm just going to delete this because I've already done that three times. And I put those files into a folder here called data. CS, or S1, CSV, S2, CSV, and S3. And these are from three separate times where I tried to run this experiment. So for, not, for now, that's just the way we're going to do saving the data. Uh, it's, just, it's just that simple. You got to make sure you copy everything from the web browser though. All right, so the next part is, I guess I'll do a combo here. I'm not sure how long this video is going to be. It could be shorter than normal or possibly a little bit longer, depending on how much I want to talk about R. Uh, if you skip ahead in this blog post, you can see some R code. It's a different color. And um, let, me, let me just show you a couple things here. So, if I render this, which I, if I press render, uh, we're going to compile our blog post. It's going to show up in the preview window. I'm getting this funny error right now, error, error while opening file. Just ignore that. I installed a pre-release version of Quarto that I think is causing that problem. And that's my fault. Uh, but, oops. Yeah, so we will be looking at this page. And if you scroll all the way down to example code, uh, we're gonna, we're, we'll be talking about this R script and what it does and uh, what it can allow us to do in terms of analyzing data. So basically we're um, gonna load our libraries. We're going to load our data files. Then we're gonna do some reaction time analysis and produce a plot. And here we're looking at the mean reaction time for correct trials to identify congruent versus incongruent trial types. And there's a Stroop effect. It's faster for congruent than incongruent. And this was based on three times I did this. So it was, this is my personal uh, Stroop effect, I guess, for three attempts. So that's what's in store. And we're going to try to understand what's going on there that you can modify the code and use it yourself. All right, uh, we haven't really used R, so to speak. We've been using the R Studio program for our Quarto blogs. And I'm going to talk a little bit about R Studio as we go through this uh, to give you some familiarity with this program. Uh, yeah, so let me move this up just a little bit and I'm going to be focusing on the console here. This is an R console where we can write R code and do things. Um, so I just did one plus one and pressed enter and we got a two back. This is one way we can enter R code and run it just like the compiler for JavaScript in a web browser. Now what's really cool about R Studio and Quarto documents is that in your blog post or in your QMD document, 
you can actually insert our scripts that can be run inside of your document. And that's what we're looking at here in this gray area from here to here. Now, just for purposes of demonstration, I'm going to uh, show you the syntax for that. It's three back ticks, a curly brace, the letter R, close the curly brace, and three more back ticks. Now, see this makes a little gray area with a play button, and you can put R code in here. So if I did one plus one and press play, um, it sends this command down to the console and runs it for you. So the console shows the output, and the output is also shown underneath what's called a code chunk. This is an R code chunk. There are, are hot keys to make these things quickly. On a Mac, I've got option command I, and it will make that code chunk for you. If once you start testing this on your own machine, uh, I rec uh, yeah I recommend that you just basically copy this whole set of code chunks just like this. Copy that whole thing into your document and try to run it. All right. Um, in order to do the analysis, we're going to need to install some R packages that might not be on your machine already. At the beginning of our code. You can see we've got this load library section, and I'm loading something called the tidyverse, that actually loads a collection of R libraries, and another one called uh, RIO for R import. I'm not sure what it stands for or if it stands for something. Let's find out. Data IO, data import. Um, input output, that's what it's probably for. <laughs> I wanted to say import export. All right. In any case, uh, when I l run the, this command, um, oh, I guess uh, let me, uh, in order to load this, in order to run this command, for example, copying it into the console and pressing enter, or you, if you're on this line and you have it highlighted, you can do command return and it will, it will load, the, load these libraries. To load it, you need to have this thing installed on, in your R, in your R uh, studio or your version of R. If you go to the packages tab here, you can look through the different packages that are already installed and um, when you run one of these lines of code, it's going to click on the various packages that you might be using for your scripts. To install a new package that you don't have, you could click the install tab uh, and just type the name. So if you start typing tidyverse, you find it there. Make sure this is clicked on, install dependencies, and press install. And that's going to install the tidyverse. You could also use this piece of code here install.packages and put that in the console and run it. And that would install that as well. So go ahead, install tidyverse and go ahead, install RIO and then come back and get ready. Let me show you an example of what this command does. It's the library function. I'm looking for the RIO package. Oh, do I not have this installed? That's my bad. Yeah, there it is. And yeah, let's say I, I had this RIO unclicked. Um, to make it available, I'm going to run this command here. And again, I'm just doing command return and it clicks it on for me. So at the beginning of my script, what I've done is loaded some libraries that we'll need later. Okay, so this next little piece um, involves trying to get the data files 
that are currently located in this folder, data and their CSV file format. And they're three separate files. I'm going to try to load these into R. The so first thing I'm doing is uh, using the list.files function to create a vector of the file names. Now I'm, I'm using the top right hand corner here to take a look at some things that are happening. When I run this one line, I'm creating a new a value, a new object up here. It's called file names. And it's got, as you can see, the path for each of the files. So data folder and then s1.csv here and data s2 and so on. So there's three files in here. I can now type the name file names into the console and, and see the contents of those things. I could use square brackets and a number to get the first one and the second thing and the third thing. I'm going to uh, use those names later on in a loop to load each file separately. So the next thing is uh, creating something called a tibble or a data frame. This is an empty table. It's kind of think of it like an Excel spreadsheet or something where we can put all the data. And we're going to add to it. OK, next, this is a loop. We're going to go through each of the file names and uh, first of all, import the file. And we could do that just like this using the Rio import function. This is a kind of a neat thing you can do with R. If you know the name of the package and then you do two colons, it's going to give you all the functions that are in that package. We're going to use the import function. And uh, just to give you a sense of what's happening here, I'm going to try to import a file in the console. If you use quotation marks and then press tab, you can search through your files here. So I'm going to search through and try to find one of these files right here. Okay, if I was to run this, it's going to try to import the whole CSV file, but it's not going anywhere. So I'm going to, I'm going to uh, create a temporary variable called temp. And R uses something called the assignment operator. It's a left arrow with a followed by a dash. And basically what the, this means is we're going to take what happens here, which is importing this whole data file and assign all of the output of that into this named object called temp. So when I press enter, we now have a new thing up here. And this is our in environment showing us what we've loaded into ours memory. That's called temp. We just made that in the console. And temp, uh, you know, has all these different parts of parts in it. We can click temp and it's going to show up over here as a table. And, and you can see we have loaded in one of the CSV files. And we've got different columns for different parts of the CSV file. The reaction time, the stimulus that was presented, the response that was made, and so on. Great. I'm going to use the rm command to remove that temporary variable for now. So that's just an example of loading a single file. And here I am going to be uh, lo loading all three files using a loop. So when um, the, the I in this loop is the number one, it's going to be loading the first file name that's in this variable and putting it into our temporary variable. I've got another thing happening here. Um, it's called the pipe function. So basically I'm loading this uh, CSV file 
and I'm doing something, I'm going to add a new column. I could do that using the mutate function. And inside of here, what I'm doing is I'm giving the name of a new column and what the number or what should be in that column. And here's why. If I look at my CSV files see uh, for S1, I can see these are the names of the columns here, RT, stimulus response, and so on. There's no name that's going to, um, there's no column for individual participants or subjects. And we want to be able to distinguish that. So we're going to be, a, we're going to be making a big table where um, we're going to load in the first subject's data and, and all the rows will be for that person. We're going to load in the second subject's data and th all the next rows will be for that person and so on. We want to know uh, which participant is which, so we need to be we need to have a column for participants that will go say like one all the way down for all the rows that are for participant one, and then two for all the ones that are for participant two and so on. And just to show you, yeah, that didn't happen. Um, uh, so we can use that. That's what this piece of code is doing here. And finally. Uh, we are, uh, so this results in a, a table and we want to add this table to our, um, what I call all data. This is going to be the global data frame that holds everything. We're using something called the rbind function to do that. So that stands for row bind. Uh, we're starting with essentially an Imagine an empty table with no columns or rows, and we're going to add to the bottom of it uh, what's ever in here, tempdf, which is the data from one participant. And then when we do the loop again, we're going to bring in the second participant's data and add that to the bottom, and then bring in the third participant's and add that to the bottom. So if we do all of these things, you can see what's going to happen actually just by pressing play here and it will run all of these lines of code and we're going to get uh, all data that should have a new column here at the end for subject and it has all the data for subject one subject two and subject three and so on so that's loading the data our next goal is to do a reaction time analysis. And uh, okay, so this is using something called the tidyverse. Uh, and that's all I'll say for now. So the first step here is we need to pre-process the data a little bit. We're taking um, the data frame and sending it, this little pipe operator, you can think about uh, sending it to another operation. So we're sending it to a filter operation. And here, what we're doing is uh, keeping the rows where particular column properties are um, selected. So for example, this one is saying, let's filter this so that we only have rows where the task column says Stroop. And if we look at all data, there is a task column here, right? And um, sometimes there is no task, sometimes there's a fixation cross. We labeled the, uh, gave the label Stroop for trials where the Stroop item was being presented. And if we filter on this one, only those ones will remain. We're also filtering on correct equals true. And there's a column called correct that says whether the uh, response was correct or not. All right, so if I do all of this, um, we create a new data table called filtered data. It has fewer things. It only has rows that say stroop here and it only has responses that were correct. There's another operation I do, and that is 
I'm changing, I'm using the mutate function to change a column property. There already is a column called RT. That's the first one. And these are the reaction times. Now there's a funny thing about this, um, the way it's loaded in, the reaction time, even though you can see it's a number, but R is treating it as if it's a string. So it's got the quotations around it and it says CHR. That means it thinks that column is a string and not a, a number. We need to convert this to a different format so that we could compute things like the mean. So this is a way to do that where we use as.numeric and um, once we do that, it turns it to a number that we can use later. So that's the first step. The next step is we wanna get the mean reaction time for each data file for each condition in the Stroop experiment. So for the congruent and the incongruent trial types. So I'm taking the filtered data table that we made and sending it to a series of pipes. The first one's called group by. And here you give the name of columns that have levels you want to group by. So we have the subject column and we want, it's gonna be one, subject one, subject two, subject three, we want one, all of those. And the congruency column, it's got incongruent and congruent, we want both of those. So you just uh, put the names of the columns separated by a comma, another pipe. And now we can use the, the summarize function. And this one's pretty cool. Uh, it allows us to create uh, new variables. And um, in this case, what we're gonna do is we're gonna compute the mean of the RT column, all right? And uh, we're basically we're gonna be making a new table that's gonna have subjects one congruent and congruent and a mean for each subject two congruent and congruent and a mean for each and so on. That means there's a new column there that is for the mean reaction times. That's this is going to be the actual numbers and we need to give the new column a name. So I'm just calling it mean underscore RT and just ignore this part. So when we do that, we get a new data table that gives us our means for subject one, two, and three. And you can kind of see here, uh, yeah, I'm a bit faster for congruent than incongruent every single time, and that's your Stroop effect. I'm gonna do a couple more examples of analysis, no statistics here, really just uh, no, no inferential tests, just dis basic descriptives. Uh, the next goal is to get the group means. So that would be the average of uh, across participants for each of the congruency conditions. So what's the average of 633 plus 673 plus 687 and so on? Get the average of those numbers. Um, here I'm taking the subject mean RT data frame that I made and I'm grouping it by congruency. So that's this column right here. And I'm using the summarize function. Again, I wanna get the mean of the mean RT variable, right? And I'm making a new column name. I'm gonna call it mean underscore reaction time. Notice there's a comma here, and it's better just to do it like this. And I'm creating another column called SEM. This stands for standard error of the mean. And I've just entered a formula to compute the standard error of the mean here. So you could have another comma and do another one, and that's what's pretty cool about the summarize function. Now if I run this, our table gets much smaller. We have the mean reaction time and uh, an estimate of the variability of that mean here based on the standard error of the mean. 
Okay, last thing is a ggplot function. This one we'll use to make a plot. Am I doing this? Yeah, get like this. And I'll just show you what happens here. If I run this, we make our plot. And so just to explain the syntax, that's the ggplot function. The first thing is the name of a, of a table we're trying to plot that has to have the data we're trying to plot. So I'm, I'm doing this based off of group mean RT. ggplot works uh, where you're going to set up what's called an aesthetic frame. AES is short for aesthetics. And let, let's show you what happens if you just run the first line. There's nothing there in terms of data, but it does set up the, the frame for you. So we're saying the X axis is going to be taken from the congruency variable. So that's this one here, it's got two levels. So it makes a congruent and an incongruent. The Y axis is gonna be taken from the mean reaction time column name. So you get that over here. Think of ggplot as painting in layers. So we've set down the first layer of the canvas and then we're gonna add new layers on top of that. And we do that using the plus symbol. So after setting up the layer, you do plus and you can add another layer. So here I've used what's called a geom bar layer. And if you just do these two, it adds, um, it interprets the two numbers here 664 and 735, 664, 735 as bars. It draws that on top. If we add, and just to try to make it easier to read here, a geom error bar layer, then, whoops, need to do all of them, then you get little error bars added on top, drawn on top of your ggplot. And I'm adding other things. I'm adding a Y lab to change the title over here and an X lab for, these are for label to change this title. And I'm setting the coordinates here to go from 400 to 800, just so we can see this difference a bit easier. So it'll go from 400 to 800 instead of zero to here. Let's just do all those. And there we go. So you can sort of displays a different range. And finally, I added something called theme classic. And that makes the, the graph go like a little cleaner like that. All right, this is a lot. I, I realize if you haven't used R, this, um, there's a lot to learn here. But I hope that, that was a good rundown, I think, of what's going on with this code. And uh, you should be able to at least obtain this code and the data files and show that you can get this working on your blog post. So you'll have to make sure that uh, you've got a blog post like this with a data folder like this with your CSV files in here. I'm going to keep going for, um, I don't know, another 10, 15 minutes here and see if we can't accomplish one more kind of analysis that is an accuracy analysis. So we could have the question, um, what proportion of times was I correct for the congruent trial type versus the incongruent trial type? It's a different type of dependent variable. So let's see what happens here. Uh, what I'm gonna do is copy this whole thing and pop it in here. All right, uh, there's one other little detail. I'm saying echo equals true inside of this curly brace. And that means the code will be available on the blog post as, as well as the outputs. So I've copied in the reaction time code and we have to talk about what we might change in order to do an analysis of accuracy. So the first thing is 
In terms of our filter, when we look at the all data, we, uh, we want to have trials that were correct and incorrect. So I'm going to, um, I'm actually going to, uh, whatever filtering we do here, it's going to be assigned to this variable called filter data. We already have one of those from above. So I'm going to call this a new name, filter data underscore PC for proportion correct. And I'm just going to get rid of this line because um, all I want to know at this point is if the, the row was a Stroop task uh, trial type. That's it. And we don't need reaction times for this, so we can just get rid of that. And our filter data now, filter data PC, that's this one, should have true and false trial types. Great. Now we need to get individual subject. Um, actually, it, and this is a this is grayed out. It's a comment. We, we're not getting means per se. We're getting individual subject proportion correct values. We have more. Uh, that's yeah. That's what we're looking to get. I'm going to change this name from subject mean RT to subject mean PC. And we want to group by the same things, but we need to write a different summarize function. So we don't want um, the mean reaction time anymore. Let's say we want a column called proportion correct. Okay, how do we compute the proportion correct? Well, it turns out that uh, this is represented as logical variables, so it's either true or false. And uh, let me give you an example of that down here in the console, where we could have a variable like this, true, 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 and one false. Did I do that wrong? Yes. Oh boy, <laughs> I've been programming in JavaScript too long and I just did something totally wrong. So I'm, I'm assigning into the variable A, you have to use uh, C for combine. I'm gonna do a true, a true, and a false. Just like that. So now our A has these three uh, values, true, true, and false, and R treats these like ones and zeros. So a true is a one and a false is a zero. That means you could do the sum function and you get a two, and you could do the mean function and you'd get um, two or one plus one divided by three. So conveniently, to compute the proportion correct, we could simply take the mean of, use the mean function on the correct column. That's this one here. And, oh, looks like proportion correct is, uh, oh, yeah, okay. That looked wrong because that's saying 100% correct on every trial, but we saw some falses, so something's messed up. And what's messed up here is I was sending in the filter data from before instead of the filter data that we made for this case right here. So now when I look at it, we can see a little bit of variability. We want to get the the group mean proportion congruent. So I'm going to start with the subject. Uh, I guess we could 
mean proportion congruent. That doesn't really make sense, actually. So I'm going to change that to a subject PC, subject PC group by congruency. And we could say mean proportion congruent and take the mean of the proportion congruent column. And we could get the standard error if we wanted to. Sure. What's going on? Portion congruent not found. Oh, I'm using the totally wrong word. Proportion correct. Wow. I was thinking too much about some other things to do with the Stroop effect. Group mean PC. All right, so now we're looking at these values. I got 96.6% correct on average on congruent trials and 92% correct on average for the incongruent trials. We could make a graph for this. So group mean PC. We have a Y value of proportion correct. Everything else, oh, we got to change these to our error bars to uh, mean proportion correct, just like this. Otherwise, oh, uh, what else do we need to change? We do mean proportion correct. And accuracy goes from zero to one. So let's see what that looks like. And if we wanted to zoom in a bit, maybe we zoom in from 0.5 to 1. All right. So we, I showed you an example of taking an existing script for reaction times, modifying it for accuracy results. The last thing I'm going to say is when, uh, when you try to use a script like this to solve the assignment from last week, so one of the assignments from last week was to have a Stroop experiment where you're manipulating some variable to try to figure out if the manipulation will cause a larger or smaller Stroop effect. So you're going to have another column, presumably, coding the levels of that factor. But let's say sometimes the words were large on the screen and sometimes they were small on the screen. So when you start getting your mean reaction times, um, for individual participants, you'll want to have the subject factor, you'll want to have the congruency factor, but you'll want one more. So let's say your manipulation was word size, and the name of the column that's coding that it was called word size. You'd want to add that in here just like this in the group by uh, function. And then you'll compute the means for every participant and um, each level of each of the factors that are in the group by function. So that's my tip for you. All right, that's it for this week. We'll see you next week where we're going to start building another experiment, this time a recognition memory experiment. And good luck.